right so um let's get going uh so welcome to uh, this is the fifth week the fifth week we're halfway through the course so welcome to the fifth week of uh, hell is other people existentialism in a time of crisis um, a free university brighton course in philosophy um, uh, yeah, there is a, you can only interact on Twitch via the chat. So yes, just in terms of how things work, um, if you want to ask particular questions or you need to interact during the lecture, then there's a Twitch chat. Um, you need to be uh, signed into Twitch to be able to do that. You need to follow the channel before you're allowed to to, to uh, say something in in Twitch chat. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be keeping a very close eye on chat, so uh, immediate responses, particularly in the middle, are probably not going to happen, um, but I will try and pay attention to those responses. So if you do have a particular question or something's particularly confusing or strange, then yeah, feel free, obviously, to ask on Twitch. And then, as I say, at eight o'clock, we will have a private seminar on Zoom. So this will continue till about 10 to 8, 5 to 8, and then we'll have a private lecture on Zoom. So if you're on Free University Brighton, the Zoom link is again on the forum. And so <laughs> it's new to it's. I think the whole situation is new to a lot of us. Um, <clears throat> so let's um let's try and first of all let's just begin with a couple of sort of uh, housekeeping things. So we've been looking at uh, fear and trembling and Kierkegaard so far, and I want to be able to bring the material that we looked at in that first half on fear and trembling um, into dialogue with the material on Sartre. Um, but that isn't going to happen for at least a week or two. And because first of all, we do need to actually try and pay attention to what Sartre is saying. Sartre, Sartre, I can never quite work out that. I'll probably just call him Sartre because that's how I usually go. Well, I usually call him. Um, but um, we'll, we'll be beginning. We'll be we'll be bringing Kierkegaard into dialogue with Sartre. So we'll be trying to draw on lessons from the Abrahamic moment, that moment of sacrifice, um, and from the whole kind of relationship to. Uh, the leap of faith and the creation of a, a particular moment of subjectivity that is key to Kierkegaard. We'll be bringing that into dialogue with what Sartre is talking about in this particular text, The Transcendence of the Ego, um, but it will be take us a couple of weeks to get to that point where we can begin to do that. First of all, we need to sort of work through the notions that Sartre is trying to develop here. And it's going to take us, a, I mean, I'm going to be able to introduce it today and we're going to try and hopefully get to that kind of one of the core distinctions that's working in the text. Uh, but we're only going to be able to probably introduce some of the most fascinating stuff that's in this text that comes in the later half. Um, and that's, that's uh, a whole, there's a whole range of odd material in there in which, in which the kind of transformation of what we think of as consciousness begins to occur. But first of all, we want to try and locate, and this is this is probably methodologically something you want to do with any philosopher. And I think other people who've who've been to my classes probably know that this. I've probably said it before. But what we want to do is we want to try and locate the problem. Um, what is it that this philosopher is is dealing with? What is the problem that they're trying to address? Uh, because it's very rare for a philosopher to write and and think in isolation and this almost i mean i would say it probably never happens i mean it, i'm not going to say never because there, there possibly are counter examples but generally speaking a philosopher is always in dialogue always in conversation um and so the context of that conversation um is is always important in trying to work out what the philosopher is saying um, it's not determinative it doesn't give a final answer to what they're saying but it does enable us to begin to sort of um, not make easy mistakes because sometimes we, when we read a philosopher, what's going on is a philosopher is beginning to build a set of concepts to interact with each other in such a way as to produce a new um, meaning or a new concept or a new line of thought. Um, and quite often what that means is that one concept is familiar to us in one, in, in one sort of set of, of, of contexts. Um, but is being shifted and moved. And so we end up with this kind of strange situation where, where interesting philosophy is taking a particular concept and it's, it's rearranging the context and the system of concepts that surround it, rearranging its meaning and in doing so shifting it quite noticeably in its, in its definition. Um, and probably what we think of as consciousness is not really what Sartre thinks of as consciousness, at least traditionally in a philosophical background. So let's sort of move along from there and we'll see where we can get to in terms of, as I say, this week is going to try and introduce us and settle us into this. 
So, uh, first of all then, the background to Sartre's work in 1937 when he writes Transcendence of the Ego is phenomenology, a particular philosophical movement called phenomenology. Um, this is a movement that is initiated by someone called Husserl um, and on the, on the back of some work by someone called Brentano, but Husserl is the initiator of phenomenology and then it develops as a particularly strong philosophical movement in the early 20th century um, and it's the inspiration for someone like Sartre as well as for someone like um, uh, Martin Heidegger. And Heidegger is a, is a student of Husserl um, and develops phenomenology in a particular direction. Now Sartre sort of takes on board um, Husserl and to a certain extent some of the work of, of Heidegger, although Heidegger thinks that Sartre sort of misunderstood him. But anyway, I mean, the, the ins and outs of that are kind of um, for scholarly investigation. And you can look and look at those yourself if you're particularly interested in the sort of intricate history of phenomenology. Um, the real issue here, the point is, is that phenomenology is the background concept, the background sort of working model, if you like, that Sartre is um, starting from but going to change. He wants to kind of address a problem that he perceives in phenomenology. And that's what the whole transcendence of the ego text is going to focus on. But phenomenology itself has introduced a new way of beginning to think about consciousness. And by new, um, what it does is attempt to take consciousness seriously um, and to not try and explain it from outside. So it, t it tries to take consciousness seriously and it tries to sort of get into the specific content of, of consciousness and how it operates. And tr it tries to operate <coughs> in terms of um, some, some basic principles and then a lot of focus on describing specific what are called phenomenological um, situations. And this basic principle, that one of the absolutely core principles, in fact, possibly the defining principle uh, upon which phenomenology operates, is this claim that all consciousness is consciousness of something. Now, this is the claim called uh, the intentional claim. And it's one that's, that's present throughout a lot of philosophy nowadays. You can find this in various different forms. Um, but it's, it's fundamentally, in the, in the phenomenological form, it's a... It's a uh, uh, an understanding or a definition in principle of what consciousness is. Now, what this does, this this idea that consciousness is always consciousness of something, <coughs> that little word of there, <laughs> that little word of, it, it does an enormous amount of work here. Um, because in being consciousness of something, um, what it's doing is is placing uh, consciousness into, a con into an always relative position. There is no such thing as consciousness itself. There is no kind of notion for the phenomenologist of just a pure and abstract and somehow clean or in the air consciousness. Instead what we have is precisely this kind of um, uh, related consciousness. So all consciousness is consciousness of something. And as I've mentioned, um, Brentano and Husserl are the kind of core of this. They're the foundation sort of location points for where we can find this concept being brought into philosophy. And so this concept, consciousness is always consciousness of something. Um, it, this, con this is kind of the core uh, we can call this the foundational principle, if you like, of phenomenology. It gives us something like an ontology. It tells us um, that, they, that consciousness is to be understood in these terms. Now, this is important. You might have your own way of thinking about consciousness, and that's absolutely fine. What we're doing here is we're trying to work out what the philosopher is saying and what this particular argument is saying. So it's, it's, it's crucial to remember that this particular definition, um, one, is all-encompassing all consciousness it doesn't refer to some consciousness or bits of consciousness all consciousness is and then it's giving the definition this related definition consciousness of something and so it's a kind of core funda fundamental principle and it operates almost at this ontological level it almost tells us what kind of things exist in the world and how they operated 
But what phenomenology also does is it develops a method of investigation of consciousness um, that's based upon this principle. And this method uh, is called the reduction. Um, sometimes in Greek it's called the epoche, um, E-P-O-C-H-E, in the transliterated English. Um, and possibly the easiest way of describing it is through the phrase bracketing. And what we do is, um, all consciousness is consciousness of something. Um, what the phenomenologist says is, we're just going to focus on that. We're going to bracket out, we're going to pull aside for now, any question of existence, any question of reality, any question of whether the thing that consciousness is conscious of exists or not. This is not going to be um, the focus. We're not going to try and develop an immediate kind of relationship to um, knowledge of objects, knowledge of things, and the truth of those things and objects. What we're going to do instead um, is we're going to focus in particular on the way that consciousness operates and we're going to take as real its appearances. Um, and to a certain extent, that's, n that's not to say that the appearances are somehow not capable of being distorted or they're not capable of being inaccurate. Um, it's not as though somehow there's a reality over there and there's an appearance and, you know, there's n they're not going to take any account of distinctions. But all those distinctions, all those connections between reality and appearance are going to be put aside for now. And we're going to take the appearance as what it is. It's got its own kind of reality. Um, and so we're going to focus in on just that element. We're going to focus in, bracket out questions of existence and focus in on what it is that consciousness is conscious of um, and how, in what form that consciousness is conscious of that thing. And so we're going to focus on um, the appearing of the appearance in many ways and the way in which an appearance comes to be an appearance for us, what kind of qualities it has. Um, what kind of uh, limits it has, what kind of colours, tones, textures, all these kind of things. Um, and we're going to do that both descriptively through a kind of sensory description. And we're also going to do that l logically. We're going to look at things that kind of are implied or, 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 or contained within um, the appearance and the way in which we think things operate. Um, I mean, this is a difficult, I mean, I, I'm pausing here because this is a kind of a slightly, <laughs> a slightly kind of difficult thing to, 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 to do very quickly because there's a huge background to phenomenology as well. Um, and one of the backgrounds to, to phenomenology we'll get to in a moment um, is, is Kant. But just for now, just carry on focusing on this notion of appearance. So when we're conscious of something, that particular thing that we're conscious of, let's say that we're conscious of the table we're sitting at at the moment. Um, that particular consciousness, that consciousness of the table, I remember consciousness, all consciousness is consciousness of something. So let's say that we're in this particular situation being conscious of a table, the table maybe you're sitting at or the chair that maybe you're sitting in. Um, we, once we're in that moment, uh, we can begin to perhaps look at it, but we've also got to kind of work out how it is that it comes to be, how it is we come to be able to recognise, if you like, or acknowledge or know that this is a chair or this is a table that's in front of us and in our appearance at the moment. Um, th we're always in a situation in which they seem completely uh, completely un untroublesome, in a sense. We always are around uh, and surrounded by appearances, and yet the way in which those appearances, the kind of way in which they become staged for us, um, it's never like uh, when we go to the theatre, in which we know that there's a kind of theatre director and there's a whole, you know, there's a whole background re re rehearsal structure going on when we're watching the theatre. Um, so we know that the appearance on the stage is kind of constructed and produced by something behind it. We don't need to worry about that in a sense here. What we need to just focus on is what's on, what's in that appearance. And inside that appearance, we can kind of we've put aside any questions of where it's come from, how it's been arranged. So we kind of we're putting out. Of, of, of line of sort of thought at the moment any of those questions about how the appearance was kind of organized in the background and what we're instead looking at is the appearance in itself and so in this sense it's, it would be much closer to focusing on um, you know the internal structure of a play and the kind of dialogue between the different characters rather than worrying about you know um, how we're going to get it out there to an audience or something along those lines so when we're talking about how appearance appears how it begins to kind of you know um, present itself to us um, 
and how something, that consciousness of something, how that something becomes a something for consciousness. Uh, we don't need to worry at all about sort of its causation structures or who's putting it there or where it's come from. What we just need to focus on is what's inside that particular appearance. And one of the things we can encounter quite rapidly is an appear any kind of appearance, anything that's a something that consciousness is conscious of, um, has a relationship of contents and form. And in particular, one of the difficulties is that we can kind of understand the sensory inputs. We can kind of understand maybe that we, we that there's a kind of light show going on and we get colours or that there's you know uh, nasal sensations that give us smells or all sorts of sensory inputs but those sensory inputs aren't organized um when we presented with that we presented them as, as though there's some sort of raw data that's then coming into the body coming into the mind coming into the subject um but we, we kind of ignore the fact that they have to be actually organized into a particular form uh, they have to be structured and, and set up into a particular form in order for us to be able to recognize the kind of blind um, input of sensation as organized into forms um, such that we can be conscious of something. Uh, and so one of the questions that, that sort of is, is, is prevalent inside philosophy from the time of Kant in particular um, is what's the source of unification of the manifold of sensation? Okay, that's a kind of technical way of putting it. So the manifold of sensation is just all that kind of input, all that stuff that's kicking around, all the stuff that even, you know, um, we, we can kind of acknowledge, even cameras can kind of encounter. Um, but that manifold of sensation, that sort of wild play of stuff, inputs and sense data, how does that get organized? How does that become unified into objects and into some things that we can be conscious of? Um, how does the unification of the appearance occur? Why why is there why are there figures in the appearance? Why are there not just blind blobs of colour that are aimlessly moving around? Now this problem obviously um, is one that is kind of being dealt with in a way by AI in a particular information technology in a particular information processing way um, and that's very very dominant amongst our contemporary lives that kind of idea that somehow there's just some sort of algorithm that can bring things together and recognize stuff and the AI just needs to be competent and technical at doing this even though somehow it still isn't very good at that in, in the vast majority of cases despite its amazing capacities um, but even in that situation what the AI is doing is simply mimicking a process so it's trying to mimic categories that all that already sorry i'll put my phone on to uh, right the ai there is trying to mimic and establish categories of what you know what things are out in the world so the little cameras going around and seeing various blobs and then it's trying to establish sort of objects people tables corners etc from what's going on but even there what it's doing is it's mimicking categories that already exist um it's mimicking human categories it needs to be able to successfully operate inside a human world so it's not being asked to form its own um, sense of objects it's being asked to be able to mimic a human sense of objects and the question then is just pushed back so where does the human how do we um, have this relationship to objects such that they, instead of just there being some wild input of random colors and shapes we can see an edge we can see a, a structure we can see a person in front of a foreground we can pick out one tree from another we can pick out the, the you know the, the grass and the field from the edge of the wood all these kind of forms, all these distinctions that are made amongst what we call the manifold of sensation, um, the way in which those distinctions are made is through a process of unification, through a process of bringing, putting certain sort of sensations together into a particularly unified whole. And the question is, is where is this unification coming from? What's, what's the source of this process? Um, and obviously there's a series of, of possible options so we can we can say that the unification comes from the object itself somehow it imposes its unification upon us um, and so we just recognize in a sense what's out there in the world um, or we could say that it comes from the subject so that we kind of organize the data input um, we kind of structure it in a particular way and so we see um, as it were what it is that we're allowed to see by our categories and, and by um, the, the way our brains work so we can so, so the unification can either come from the object or it can come from the subject or of course we've got other logical alternatives it can come from both it can be a kind of a relationship between the subject and object or it can come from neither and it can come from some other source it maybe comes from i don't know god's brain or something else you know so we've got four kind of possible options here now 
these these kind of this unification problem or this way in which as it were what we what kant called intuitions which is what we might think of as sense data or sense input or you know um sensory inputs what kant called intuitions and um on the one hand and concepts on the other now concepts are those things in our brain cats dogs houses cars um, in which we try to take a whole set of objects and we organize them into a class a concept um, so Kant's idea was that well intuitions and concepts have to operate together um, and in, without them being able to operate together what you end up with is, are kind of empty concepts um, or or what we sometimes refer to as blind intuitions so, so intuitions that we in which we can't really see anything because it's just a mass of you know undis, uh, you know um, indiscernible indifferentiable kind of sensation and so what Kant did in order to try and um, organize uh, an account of how we know the world um, was precisely try and account for this relationship between unification and he tried to present a situation in which both the subject and the object had a role to play in that what he tended to do however or what tends to happen inside Kant's philosophy is that we end up um, as it were splitting the world into two um, and so there's a world in which things are the way they are and then there's another world in which things are the way we see them and things are the way we perceive them so there's this like world of the real the, the noumenal which we actually can't know anything about because all we can ever know is the way in which we're organized um, to see things in the world and this is a very very prevalent uh, phenomenon nowadays when people talk about things like cultural relativity or you know um, seeing things within the context of their own particular situation uh, what they're essentially saying is that the people have got some kind of we can call them Kantian spectacles on um, and so they see the world and they can't but they can't help but see the world through this particular structured set of categories that they have and obviously sometimes these categories can be intensely political um, and at the moment we're involved in um, and there's the whole uh, struggle going on around black lives matter and and the category of black there the category of of, of how that category operates inside our societies is up for dispute um, but generally speaking this idea that we see the world through kind of categories contexts, cultures suggest that we kind of we kind of trapped inside that situation and this in a sense this is in a sense a kind of Kantian form um, Kant basically says that we can't see the world as it is we can only see the world as we have to see it um, we have no options other than to see it through our own particular set of categories and the way in which we organize and structure the world so what he does is locate the the, con the, the source of unification of the world inside our brains inside our psychologies inside our minds that's the source of unification it needs the material of the world as well as the categories but the actual active force is essentially um, our minds um, and we are kind of trapped inside the way in which we organize the world uh, and the way in which his argument went to, in order to try and do this was he, he tried to take a big step back um, and he set up what was called this is the this is the origin of what's called transcendental philosophy um, not transcendent transcendental and transcendental always refers to um, something that's called conditions of possibility um, so the argument for Kant was consciousness perception knowledge it can only happen if certain pre-existing conditions already exist um, it can only happen if in a sense uh, there are already certain conditions of possibility uh, um, you know um, as it were that have uh, that have established limits it's not like we can see anything at all in the world we can only see what we're in a sense structured to be able to see um, but there are certain limits to that structure so for example um, Hume whom Kant is responding to Hume had shown that the problem of science was was greater than just accuracy or repeatability or things like that it actually came down for Hume to a really fundamental problem which was that the very kind of cause and effect law uh, that was taken as a principle for scientific endeavor was itself um, ungrounded and Hume argued in a sense uh, it was just convenience these things um, always went together for us um, they always correlated um, and so instead of us understanding that they were just two things that went together we kind of associate them as cause and effect it's a bit of a simplification but that's basically what he sort of roughly what he argues and Kant 
essentially reject this because what Hume is doing is essentially saying that it's all just in in our imagination. There's no real cause and effect that we can access. And what Kant basically turned around and saying is, is anyone who is going to have an experience can only have an experience if they have the category of cause and effect. Without that category, the very concept of experience doesn't actually operate. Um, and he did this with a series of other concepts. He says essentially that, that what we think of, what we know to be experience, he's already structured in particular ways by categories like cause and effect. And we can't have any experience outside of those structures. And so these are what you call the conditions of possibility of any experience whatsoever. Um, any experience whatsoever is kind of limited in, um, in, in terms of these, these experiences. We're going to take a little tea break there, just five minutes. I'll just pop that in, uh, just five minutes. Um, uh, yeah, there you go, five minutes, back at 1930, and then we'll begin to move on from, from that peculiar little start. It's obviously, if you've got any particular questions or anything else, welcome to ask them now. Um, it's a good idea to have a stretch, stretch your legs, get a cup of tea, whatever, something like that. Um, I'm just going to go and do that. I'm just going to go to the loop. 
All right, let's get back onto it. So, can't divide is what happens. Um, just to recap that, um, can't can't divide the world into these phenomenal and noumenal realms. Um, the phenomenal realm, the world of appearances, uh, is the only realm that's accessible through experience. It's the only thing that we can encounter. Reality is kind of something um, that only really can refer to this phenomenal world. And what he calls empirical reality is always dealing with this this world um, of appearances, the phenomenal. Um, what we often think of as reality, the, the way things are in themselves, this is kind of beyond us. Um, we can only know the way we see things. So reality as it appears, um, appears within the limits of, of any possible experience. Um, and the unity of that experience is given by the necessary structures, uh, categories such as cause and effect, <coughs> that we have to re have to structure the world with. We can't help but, we can't have any experience that's not structured by the categories of our experience. Um, it's not structured within the limits of possible experience. Now Kant's framework <coughs> produces, as I say, these limits to particular experience. And one of these limits, the crucial one perhaps for our attention at this point, is this um, particular idea, let's put that up, uh, <clears throat> that the I think must be able to accompany any of our representations. And to our representations, the way we kind of, that's the appearance, if you like, of, of the world. Um, and this, this idea, this is one of the limits, this is one of the structures uh, that Kant sort of puts forward. It comes from its origin in Descartes, um, and it, but it's a structure. It's a, for, for Kant, there isn't any experience that can't be had, that can be had rather, um, that doesn't have the possibility of saying I have this experience being attached to it. So this, the I think I'm having this experience, can always be attached to any description um, of of what's going on. Now, what Husserl and, and phenomenology do is they offer um, a way of understanding actual experience. <laughs> it sounds like what Kant was doing, but in fact Kant was kind of giving us the limits of any possible experience. Um, what an actual experience looked like, he doesn't necessarily need to tell us. Um, he can just tell us that it has to be within those limits. Um, now, obviously, should we just move that a little bit? Uh, that's that makes sense, you know. It, you know, there's not there's not a there's not a problem there in, in 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 one way. Although the problem comes in that those limits actually do limit our contact with the world. Um, so we have to bear that in mind. But the crux of what phenomenology does is is ignore, in a sense, uh, the split between phenomenal and noumenal that Kant has set up, whilst accepting the structures of the phenomenal. Uh, experience that Kant has set forward. In other words, that it's got certain sorts of limits, it's structured in a particular way, and the world is only um, ever a world that is seen through that particular set of structures, concepts, categories. Um, but what they do is they want to focus on, on the actual experience itself, um, and what they do, therefore, is describe experiences in intimate detail very, very closely, um, and they try and pick out from those situations key things that are um, that we might say essences or universals and things that appear all over the place key elements of experiences uh, of things like objects for example such that objects always have um, sides that aren't given to us objects always hide a certain side they always have a backside as it were um, they always have other sides um, and that's part of what makes an object an object so this would be a kind of way in which a phenomenologist would encounter the appearance and pick out from the appearance certain sorts of what we might call logical structures um, but Sartre picks up on this focus on actual experiences and wants to run with that he wants to he wants to he thinks phenomenology has done an enormous service to philosophy by focusing us back on actual experiences but what he argues is that they they have a tendency um, to uh, take the limits of possible experience that, that Kant had sort of set out um, and then make experience, as it were, conform to those limits. Now, those limits are limits in principle, uh, the limits of validity, the limits of things that we could possibly be experienced. They have no, and this is Sartre's point, they don't say anything about the way experience is actually um, encountered. And so 
the the validity issue of what it is that has to happen for that to for this particular thing to be an experience that validity issue is distinct from the factual issue um so Sartre's question is straightforward and it's a it's a question that is the absolute sort of center starting point for transcendence of the ego um he says does this I think that must be able to accompany all our representations in fact accompany all our representations and so in principle it's always possible according to our Kantian and a phenomenologist um, for us to take one of our experiences let's say the experience of sitting in a chair and to say something like I think I am sitting in a chair I think I'm experiencing sitting in chair um, it's always possible for them to do that in principle um, but as Sartre says but in fact is that what happens particularly in regard to consciousness and he asks three questions which we can let's just move this a bit for you so you can see them he asks three questions the first is if the I think must, must be able to accompany any experience does it in fact accompany them and his response is basically no it doesn't um, in fact accompany them um, there are therefore experiences in which in fact there is no I think there there is no I there um, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be changed and doesn't mean that in principle the I think couldn't be attached to it but in practice in fact it's not um, not every time that's at least Sartre's point the second question he asks is when the I think does actually accompany any experience so when we do attach it does it alter the form of that experience is it the same experience when I go I think I'm sitting in a chair as, as sitting in a chair um, and he says yes it changes it um, and this in fact is also key to the phenomenologist in many ways because what they're doing when they're bracketing is they're trying to as it were um, shift the content of what it is we're focusing on but the crux, the crux is is when the I think does accompany when you do that operation and you reflect on something that you've had an experience of and then you are able to attach the I think I was having that experience um, does it change the nature of the experience and Sartre is saying yes it does and his third question and this comes back to that this relationship to to what is, what is it that brings things together what is it that gives form to our experience um, the third question is the the eye that's made possible by experience what's sometimes called the synthetic unity of our representations which is just a way of describing as it were the way in which we've synthesized brought together those different elements of our sensory experience um, so is the eye made possible by experience or is it the eye that unites our represent representations into experience um, now what this essentially is focusing on is is the I that I that I think of as myself and the I that we encounter in the cogito I think therefore I am is this I an effect of some prior pre-existing thing that's going on some other process or is it a cause does it does it does experience originate from the I or does the I originate from experience um, now Sartre's answer is a little a little complicated here because he's not going to say it's cause or effect in a sense he's going to say that it breaks the order of cause and effect um, and that there's going to be something radically different going on um, and he contrasts two moments um, let's get rid of that he contrasts two moments in Husserl at which there's a kind of mistake made um, the first moment he identifies in Husserl's logical investigations this is on Transcendence of the Ego page 37 so these are the references TE 37 here uh, the references TE and the number points to the page so he says that he says that Husserl's mistake occurs between Husserl's earlier work and later work Husserl's earlier work a text called the logical investigations where Husserl says that the me that stuff that I am the me is a synthetic and transcendent production of consciousness and so consciousness somehow exists in a particular form and then from that there is the arises a me a notion of a me so the me is an effect or it's produced and at this point Sartre is even you know Sartre is following Husserl and basically says he's essentially got most you know that's kind of right 
Um, and he says explicitly what Husserl does is he reverts to um, a more problematic notion when he gets to the text ideas. And this is a later text in Husserl's work. And here Husserl says that the I is behind each consciousness. It's a necessary structure of consciousness whose rays would light upon each phenomenon presenting itself in the field of attention. The, that, that idea of it being like a spotlight or a beam of light um, and so that's the eye and as it as it you know hits something that thing is now in the field of attention and so what you have is the eye is this kind of um, it, it's the light source and it's the bulb in that light it's that kind of thing that's pointing um, in, this, in the source of the light that's pointing uh, whatever's brought into its gaze whatever's brought into its field of attention and there the eye becomes a kind of cause or a producer of the experience. Um, now what Sartre points to instead is something a little bit more interesting. He points to this thing that I would refer to as a partnership of objects. <coughs> so a partnership of objects. The object's not passive. This is one of the things that's kind of crucial here and the eye is not necessarily just a subject. That can also be an object. Um, but let's just try and take this through. So for phenomenologists, we're going to compare phenomenologists and Sartre because this is what's going on in the transcendence of the ego. There's, there's a background of phenomenology and then there's a break point that Sartre wants to locate um, and which essentially originates, starts his own particular project. And so that if we if we like, there's a kind of forking off um, between the two things, between phenomenology, um, let's put that there, uh, between phenomenology and existentialism. So existentialism, Sartrean existentialism, arises out of phenomenology by disagreeing a particular point with the way in which phenomenology is, is moving. So for phenomenologists, uh, the object essentially has a particular kind of role, um, and what it does is if we focus on the object in experience, it reveals uh, the thing that experience is conscious of. So consciousness is always consciousness of something if we look at that something that is the, that consciousness is conscious of then what we can kind of do is is we can see um, by doing so how you know how consciousness was orientated what it was looking at what it was paying attention to um, and specifically phenomenology brackets out the existence of the object as irrelevant because we're not really concerned with it in phenomenology we're not concerned with the object itself we're concerned with the way in which consciousness is conscious of it um, and so it just plays this kind of role of um, uh, you know um, like a clue uh, as to what consciousness is doing and, and is rapidly discarded afterwards in many ways um, for Sartre, for Sartrean existentialism, however, the object plays a foundational role in a partnership or something like a negotiation between consciousness and the world. Um, consciousness of consciousness, um, now that's a specific form of that, <laughs> that, that kind of intentional relationship. So if all consciousness is consciousness of something, um, one of the things it can be conscious of is obviously itself. So consciousness of consciousness for Sartre uh, can reveal this particular kind of what we might call engagement in the world um, for phenomenology there's always and for Kant there's always a sense that we're, we're kind of our encounter with the world is through some sort of screen through through something like a, a screen a set of spectacles through some kind of um, uh, you know form of organization of the world that, that we're kind of trapped behind like we're trapped behind a screen um, and so we can begin to see that screen when we examine the relationship between me and the screen and what I'm seeing. But we're still kind of trapped behind the screen. And in a sense, we don't really care whether the things in the screen, we don't really care whether the people in the TV are real. Um, but obviously, we, you know, we can have a, an understanding of, of, of our consciousness of what we're seeing by paying a little bit of attention just to the, the objects as though we were taking them seriously. And so we're always kind of behind a screen. We're always kind of trapped a little bit. Um, behind this particular way of seeing um, and we can examine different ways of seeing and we can maybe shift and change those but all of this kind of always leaves us um, at a slight disconnect from the world it's as though somehow we're always touching the world through this seeing the world through a screen or touching it through gloves or you know speaking to each other through a, a mask or something there's always some you know gap there's always some block between us and the thing that we're relating to and that block is the way we see things, the way we have to see things, the way we can't but see things, um, which are categories. 
But in this particular situation of consciousness of consciousness, you know, Sartre thinks we can we can see something more going on, and we can see the engagement with the world taking place. This is to quote Sartre. This is from page forty, Transcendence of the Ego. The existence of consciousness is an absolute, because consciousness is consciousness of itself. This is to say that the type of existence of consciousness is to be consciousness of itself. And consciousness is aware of itself insofar as it is consciousness of a transcendent object. All is therefore clear and lucid in consciousness. The object with its characteristic opacity is before consciousness, but consciousness is purely and simply consciousness of being conscious of that object. This is the law of its existence. A, a strange passage. The more you use the word consciousness in this situation, the more it seems to almost become devoid of meaning, and it's a kind of repetitive notion of this strange word. that has, it, It's the same if you repeat almost any word. It will slowly kind of dissipate its meaning, um, which in itself is a curious phenomenon. But the crux here, consciousness is aware of itself insofar as it is consciousness of a transcendent object. So when consciousness it kind of refers to itself the thing that it's taking there is placed outside of itself it's transcendent it's not inside it's outside and this is the curious thing so we have this kind of strange relationship to consciousness in which one in one situation in its core situation the way it actually is if you like is to be outside of itself this is a strange one we'll have to kind of explore it it's not necessarily um you know massively complicated but it can get a bit difficult but let's explore it first of all by the way it's presented oops let's just get this one by the way it's presented inside um inside transcendence of the ego which is this uh this distinction between two modes of consciousness between a, a mode of unreflected first degree of consciousness and a reflective or second degree of consciousness um, now famously we have the cogito saying something like I think therefore I am we reach this moment after having gone through a whole process of doubt having in, you know installed us inside the mind of the evil demon and all sorts of other peculiar examples of, of you know interesting philosophical thinking we reach this moment where we've been going through a whole process of reflection on our knowledge um, but we reach this moment this moment at which we encounter a kind of um, a certainty what previously I've just Sartre's just described as an absolute, if you like, something that exists in itself completely without any, um, ex no external causation presented here. It's a kind of absolute in itself. And we encounter the cogito almost like this, as a kind of moment of certainty. Um, but one of the things that, that we, 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 it's, it's difficult to kind of pin down to and quite often why it makes sense to when, when you look at the cogito to, to try and remember where it comes from and that whole process that it, it involves uh, the doubt get you know the, the gets you to the cogito is because I mean, as it is again to quote Sartre the consciousness which says the I think there is not the consciousness which thinks the I think therefore I am there's two different consciousnesses at work here for, for Sartre there's a moment of reflection um, the I think and then there's this moment of the unreflected or there's a different moment of consciousness but Sartre's very keen to make sure that um, let's how to put this he's very keen to make sure that um, uh, it is not the process of reflection that produces the unreflected unreflected consciousness is going to come first um, and the process of reflection is going to do something different he uses this example on page 43 of um, looking remembering looking out of a window on a train and seeing the landscape and he says it's possible for him to bring back the memory of that landscape um, but he can also recollect he says that he was seeing it um, so he can also recollect that he was seeing it um so i mean you have to think about that in yourself in terms of a memory you know you, you can you can remember some situation but when you remember that situation you also kind of know and you can bring to the fore you can make explicit the fact that you're there um but that that reflection on a memory is what he calls secondary second degree consciousness and the first degree consciousness was the moment on that train 
as he stared out the window at the landscape, in which he was absorbed in the landscape and the movement of the train. How can consciousness be before itself and itself? Yeah, uh, right, we'll have to, that's, <laughs> you can carry on with that for a moment. So, but that moment on the train, let's just fix, stick with that for a moment. That moment on the train, there's not a reflective moment going on there, which is what Sartre is saying. There's a moment of engagement. He's enraptured, caught up with, absorbed in. Um, but whenever we reflect upon that, even if, even if it was still on the train, if we were like to think about what it is we were doing, as soon as we reflect, the I appears. I am doing this. That's what happens. Um, and so, as he just says, as soon as we engage in reflective activity, at once the eye appears. It just suddenly arrives. But he also says that the eye never appears except on the occasion of a reflective act. So in this sense, the eye... The eye... Whilst it can always accompany uh, an act of consciousness doesn't always accompany it uh, in fact is is produced at the moment at which i enact uh, a reflective operation and the moment in which i reflect on what i'm doing then this notion of the i is suddenly going to pop up so before there is an i that like if we might say has consciousness of a chair there's simply consciousness of the chair um not an i am in a chair i am sitting i there is just the sitting the, the consciousness of that sitting and so what we encounter is, in effect, a process in which um, reflective activity brings with it a distortion. And we can talk about distortions of reflection. The unreflected consciousness, um, that which kind of comes first and is before itself almost, if you like, in terms of the question that was asked, that, that unreflected consciousness, first degree consciousness, has, Sartre thinks, ontological priority over the reflected consciousness. Um, because the unreflected consciousness, he argues, does not need to be reflected in order to exist. So we don't need to think about what we're doing in order to be doing something. We don't need to um, you know, be, be self-aware when we're on the train, staring out of the landscape as to what we're doing. Um, we can, of course, become self-aware at any moment. In doing so, we've, dis we've moved the kind of... Oops, sorry, let's just go back there. We've moved the consciousness a little bit. We've put a second degree consciousness rather than a first degree consciousness, and there's a distortion that comes in. Um, now, that engagement with the world, that being caught up with the world, the landscape, being drawn into that, is, this is a relationship that we might call a relationship of desire. Um, and the reason I'm going to say that is because Sartre, Sartre has this lovely little slogan saying, reflection poisons desire. Um, um, and so what we what we want to think about is this process in which the very act of thinking the very act of being reflective um, if taken as productive if taken as source if taken as cause um, when we reflect we're actually doing something uh, that, that is going to shift and distort the thing that we're reflecting upon we are already consciousness um, without being conscious of our consciousness if you like um, and that consciousness is still a consciousness of something so we, when we are already consciousness we're, we're still involved and enraptured and engaged with something else but the crux is that the, 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 there's no the, 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 it's not reflection that causes us to become conscious it's not reflection unreflected consciousness must be Sartre says considered autonomous um, and this comes down to in effect giving back to objects a power of, of capturing us, giving back to objects one of the sources of unification of what an object is, giving back to objects, as it were, you know, a reality. This is to quote Sartre. I'll just read this little passage. Uh, this is from page 57, I believe. Um, we arrive at the following conclusion, he says. Unreflected consciousness must be considered autonomous. It is a totality which needs no completing at all. We must acknowledge with no qualifications that the character of unreflected desire is to transcend itself by apprehending on the subject the quality of desirability. Everything happens as if we lived in a world whose objects, this is the bit I really like about this passage, everything happens as if we lived in a world whose objects, in addition to their qualities of warmth, odour, shape, had the qualities of repulsive, attractive, delightful, useful, and as if these qualities were forces having a certain power over us. In the case of reflection, and only in that case, affectivity is posited for itself as desire, fear. Only in the case of reflection can I think, I hate Peter, I pity Paul. 
Now this is this is going to be crucial because the relationship he describes in this in the text, um, in which he, he's talking about this this relation of hate and, and pity with regard to Paul, the actual experiences of, of those um, encounters doesn't have an eye there. The experience of those encounters is is organised through the objects themselves, including the other subjects, the other people that we're encountering. It's not organised through our categories. It's not organised through us, you know, a, a screen, and, and and it's not somehow produced by an act of thinking. The me, and this is going to finish, and then we'll have a little break before the Zoom starts. The me, Sartre says, must not be saw in the states of unreflected consciousness, it's, nor behind them. The me appears only with the reflective act. The I, he says, is the ego the, as the unity of actions, and the me is the ego as the unity of states and qualities. And this is what we're going to explore. This is what he looks at in the second part. I've tried to cover the first part, part one, three sections in part one of the Transcendence of the Ego. So I've tried to like look at the first three sections, and then we're going to move to the second part of Transcendence of the Ego next week. And what he's going to look at is precisely this difference between the I, the element of the ego that's unity of actions and the element of the ego that's unity of states and qualities. And so he's got this doubled perspective, um, which is kind of central and crucial. He's got this doubled relationship to consciousness. And this is what we need to, first of all, begin to be very clear about. The doubled reflective, uh, the doubled nature of consciousness on a, at a, an unreflective level and at a reflective level. And the unreflective level is the most important. It's autonomous. It's not produced by the reflective level. Um, reflective level kind of reflects on the unreflected. Um, it's autonomous. It's not produced by the by the reflective, and it, it, and, it and it's not kind of organised um, uh, on its own. It's it's organised in relationship with the objects because it's always even at the unreflected level consciousness of something consciousness is always engaged it's always entangled it's always wound into and you know connected to and driven by and brought forth through um the the thing that it's conscious of um and can be changed therefore by changing the thing that it's conscious of um before we even need to worry about reflection Anyway, so that's a kind of intro, I suppose, to, to the transcendence of the ego and to this first initial division that Sartre wants us to bring up, you know, to understand. And, and to this key idea that, that at the heart of consciousness is an activity that doesn't have an I, doesn't have a person. It's a kind of activity in itself that we need to begin to pay attention to and that most of us don't really think of consciousness as we kind of think of that as being my consciousness or yours we kind of think of it as being personal we kind of think of it as having an eye and, and this crux is is that at the unreflected level it doesn't have these things it's impersonal um it doesn't necessarily have an eye there or it doesn't have an eye there um and and it's and it's engaged and it's connected to objects rather than having to force them Anyway, I'm going to stop there um, and I will, as I say, see you on Zoom in about five minutes if you're in FUB um, and if not, I'll catch you next week.